Hello everyone, uh, it's Sakib from AppsCode. I'm one of the developer behind the Kube Vault project. So uh, uh, our today's uh, webinar is titled as Kube Vault Ops Request, Data Lifecycle Management for Vault and Kubernetes. So let's start by taking a look at the table of contents for today's webinar. So uh, initially we'll start by deploying our Vault server. And um, before doing that, we recently added support for PDB for disruption budget for Vault cluster. I will go through the concept of PDB and the reason behind adding it for our Vault cluster support. And we recently updated our Vault Health Checker. Um, I will briefly discuss some of the field of the Vault uh, Health Checker that you can configure. And uh, the feature is yet to be released, the Vault Ops request. I will demonstrate a couple of them in the demo, uh, the demo part of the webinar. And lastly, but not least, uh, I will show some KubeVault CLI command that can automate some painful stuff for your convenience. Uh, some of these features are yet to be released, so we are uh, open to discussion and your feedback. So without further ado, let's start. So uh, here is the installation command. You can install our KubeVault Enterprise operator chart using the self install command that we can also find in our website. So before uh, deploying the Vault Server YAML um, and showing the issuer and Vault Server YAML field here, uh, let's talk some about the PDB support that we recently added for our Vault cluster. So uh, if you are using Kubernetes, you may have also heard about the terminology of PDB or pod disruption budget and why it's useful or it's recommended for your production grade cluster and in terms of vault. So uh, when you want to build a highly available application such as vault, uh, you need to understand what type of disruption that can happen to your vault pods or your vault cluster. And if we categorize this sort of disruptions, we can categorize them in two different categories. One is voluntary disruption, another is unwanted disruption that can also happen, uh, which are a bit unavoidable. So some of the unavoidable cases, which are involuntary disruptions that may happen to your vault cluster can be uh, due to hardware failure or physical machine that is backing up your vault nodes, or maybe the cluster administrator sometimes deletes something accidentally or by mistake, or the cloud provider or hypervisor failures make the VM disappear while your vault server was running. And in terms of the voluntary disruption, the application owner or cluster administration can sometimes just want to disrupt the nodes for maintenance purpose or other purposes. For example, for draining a particular node to repair or upgrade, and he may want to remove a vault pod from a particular node to permit another node or another resource to fit in. So in order to maintain the quorum or some sort of stability to a vault cluster, you need to have some sort of PDB set up for the vault cluster. We recently added the PDB supported. So when you deploy a vault server, a associated PDB will also be created. So now let's take a look at the vault issuer. So we are using SART Manager uh, to manage our vault TLS. So we need to create an issuer for that. So here is the YAML for our issuer. To do that, we need to also create a secret that I've already created. Let's take a look at the Vault Server YAML. And one of the important things that I wanted to show here, uh, I will go through it a bit. So essentially, uh, I'm pretty sure you have already seen the Vault Server YAML before. So the client is set to Vault Server and the name and namespace is there. And in the spec section, it, uh, you have the TLS here, where I have referred the same issuer that we need to create earlier. I'm using the Vault version 1.10.3. I'll be deploying three replicas. I want to specially mention this particular field here, the health checker. So as I already mentioned that we have recently improved our health checker. It is uh, some sort of uh, done in a particular way that our DB product, KubeDB, operates for its database. Uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, two different fields and I will explain what some of the specs mean here. So as the backend, uh, we have the raft storage on a boot. For Unsling, I'm using the Kubernetes secret option where I'll be giving uh, 
uh, generating three secrets and we'll need two of them to answer it. Uh, permission policy, I have set it out as the wipeout. So uh, let me briefly discuss as some of the health checker fields here. So we have the health checker uh, period seconds. So it basically indicates the interval between each health check iteration. So if we deploy vault server and if we want to, the, if the user want to enable or configure the health check iteration based on his workloads, he can set the time field according to his needs. And the timeout second is also there. So basically it sets the timeout for each health check iteration. After it, the timeout will be happy and it will not work. And for the failure threshold, uh, so it basically specifies the number of consecutive failures to make the vault server state as not ready. And at the same time, uh, we didn't have this uh, feature before. So this is basically a disable write check. Uh, so user can also configure whether he wants to but make any specific check that fault server is uh, getting the connection request also. Uh, it's taking the right check and recheck step. So here is the sum of the fields uh, of the health check. So now I think uh, we can uh, deploy the fault server. So let's, uh, uh, so let's check the issuer. So we have the vault issuer that we have already created. Now let's apply the vault server YAML. And while the vault server is getting created, uh, let's take a look at the PDB that is also getting created. So we can see that uh, associated PDB uh, which will uh, select the vault server ports uh, using this uh, selectors. So our vault server is coming up. Let's wait for it to be ready. So now our vault server is critical state. That means it's accepting connection, but not all the replicas are ready. And we can also see that uh, in the PDB section, it's a Kubernetes native resource. So uh, I, I hope you're familiar with some of the field. So currently, uh, no disruption is allowed as we are deploying three replicas. And we calculated the PDB as the floor of the number of replicas minus one by two. So at least uh, one of the maximum unavailable replicas at least could be one. So now we have uh, two replicas. So currently two healthy ports, so there is no real disruption allowed. But currently uh, we have three ready replicas and desert number of healthy replicas of two. So then we can at least have one of them unavailable. So currently the vault server is not ready, although all the ports are up because it's uh, awaiting a right check. Once the right check is done, then the vault server will move to the ready state. Although it's accepting connection right now, we can check the vault status, but it's not probably ready to write or read yet. So now our vault server is currently ready. So the way we are uh, enabling our vault server read write check is by enabling a KV secret engine in our vault server. So where we are enabling a KV particular secret engine, uh, version one specifically, and we are trying to uh, write some values in there. So if this is successful, then we have the vault server status as uh, read write okay. We have, uh, enable a particular field for read write check and the rest of the fields are as it is as before but we have uh, ensured that the read write check is passed then we're ensuring that the vault server is ready so now uh, i can uh, actually show you uh, the kb secret engine that we're uh, enabling here so to do that uh, let's port for from vault and let me export some of the environment variables So I can see our vault server status here. And if I check the secrets list, uh, I should be able to see a particular KV secret engine. So this is the helper secret engine uh, that we're enabling for our, from our end. 
to check the refresh status of this call server. So it's enabled and also it's getting the read and write status properly, which is being updated here in the vault status. So since our vault server has been deployed, uh, I think we can go to the ops request field. So uh, when we deploy a particular vault server, uh, that's the first thing that's done. But now, uh, since our, in our production, we may have various operations that are also required in terms of our maintaining our vault server. For example, if you want to take a particular backup or if you want to reconfigure your TLS, which is going to be expired pretty soon, or if you want to do any sort of maintenance stuff or upgrade stuff, then you can do by using vault ops request. So we are going to demonstrate a couple of obstacles here. The first one is Vault Ops Request Reconfigure TLS. So I have the Vault server, which is already TLS enabled. I'm going to patch some particular field, uh, which you can see here in the subject organization section. Uh, I'm going to patch this field and I'm going to add a particular email address here. So before doing that, uh, let's take a look at the current TLS field here, how it looks like. So if I exit into our vault server, so let's take a look at the certificate here. Let's take a look at the TLS cert field, uh, which field we have already enabled. So I'm going to use the cert logic to decode my certificate. So these are essentially some of the field that I have already in my certificate. Now, uh, what I want to do, let's get out of it. Now I want to apply my reconfigured TLS field, which is going to patch my certificates with some particular field. So let's apply the reconfigured TLS here. So you can see in this particular section here that my reconfigured TLS ops request is currently in progress. So in terms of upgrading or reconfiguring our Vault TLS, Vault has certain guidelines how we should proceed or how it's the standard of proceeding with a particular upgrading in terms of Vault. So Vault expects us to uh, rolling update in terms of the highly available part here. So we are going to first identify which nodes are our follow on node and which are our leader node. And initially, we want to upgrade our follow on nodes first, and then we want to update our active node. So, what actually will happen? The Vault server will initially, when the follow on node is down, Vault server will still be connected, able to connect to the active node. So, it will be in critical stage. Then, when all the Vault server is dead, then it will be in ready state. So, currently, the uh, the Vault port two is terminating, but still in a critical state. So, it's still connectable to the Vault server the active node is there. Once all the follow-up node is terminated and we started back up with updated configuration, then it's going to finally update the active node. Then it's going to, again, check the read write status. Then uh, the follow server should be in a particular ready state. And we can also see the for disruption budget getting updated uh, as well as the vault ops request. So all the nodes are up. So because of that, our obstacles has been made successful. Now Vault will check if it's possible to read or write. And in terms of that, the status may update to not ready. So it will actually reflect the actual status of the Vault server. So uh, I can see in the logs that the read write is actually possible. So our Vault server status is uh, in terms of readiness, it's actually ready. So now our ops request reconfigured TLS has been actually successful. Now I actually want to see if the fields that I wanted to update are actually been updated or patched. So let's 
again uh, it's a computer call now if i see the subject trees here uh, i should be able to see that the organization fields that wasn't earlier there, uh, it has been patched and updated. And also the email that I provided is also being set here. So uh, looks like our obstacle has done its work and it has updated the status field. So, uh, I want to demonstrate uh, another obstacle here. Uh, so, which, uh, which is the rotated certificates. So the use case I was uh, discussing earlier. So as in that you are using Vault, but uh, the license is about to expire and the TLS certificate will be validated and you won't be able to <coughs> use it anymore. So now in that case, what you can do, you can simply apply a vault uh, ops request, we configure TLS to rotate the particular certificates. So what it will do, it will create a new set of certificates and it will also upgrade the vault server nodes with those newly credential certificates. So now uh, let me apply the reconfigured TLS rotate certificate. Uh, so we can see that our rotated TLS ops request is in progress. So uh, if you actually noticed that uh, initially uh, when I first ran the reconfigured TLS, it first uh, it started the vault one, then vault two, then vault zero. Vault zero was basically the leader node in terms of that. Now it's doing in a particular different order. So the regardless the order of the for this start, it will always do the forward node first, then eventually it will do the later nodes first. Cause, uh, because there is a very simple reason behind that, uh, you cannot upgrade your vault cluster with zero downtime. But what you can do with best possible scenario and best possible steps, you can try to minimize the downtime as much as possible. So in our case, we're trying to keep the vault server when all the ports are not ready, uh, we're trying to down the follow node first. So such that it's in critical state and active nodes are also connected with. So that's the upgrade strategy we're following in terms of keep vault here. So let's wait a bit. Uh, to all the port to come up, back up. So Vault 1 must have been the uh, leader node uh, uh, after our last ops request. So it's been now terminated as the last port. So our obstacle sorted TLS has also been succeeded, and we can I can see that the retrite is also been successful. So our vault phase is currently in creating, and our obstacle has been successful. Now, if I check the time period of this certificate, I can see when it was created and the duration that it has. So let me copy and paste it. So I can uh, you can see that the time when it was from valid. So our initial certificate was valid from 310 uh, 1 September to 310 13 November. Now it has been updated and it's like that. Uh, you can see the time because they are still the same. So time has been uh, from 319 to 319 30th of November. So now the time period has been updated uh, from the period is going to be valid for another 30 days since it's uh, 
in, in, in it's, it's a community level license. So uh, that was our reconfigured TLS, our uh, rotate and the reconfigured TLS. Uh, now, uh, in terms of default CLI, uh, in terms of default CLI, uh, we are always trying to uh, see our user's pain point. And the general goal is to automate uh, all the tedious and boring stuff, um, which can be automated. Uh, we want to automate it. And you see, it is still a work in progress. Uh, we see a lot of people for all the time to implement and trying to get hands on some of the stuff. So basically, uh, Vault has certain guideline how you can generate a Vault root token using your ANSI keys. So in general, you don't really want to get hold of the Vault root token, which has all the privileges. So you can throw it out of the windows, basically. But say you want to have the Vault root token for a particular reason, then how do you combine those ANSI keys that you already have scattered to some group of people? You can combine them using default CLI and you can generate the ultimate root token. So uh, it's still a work in progress, but um, I want to demonstrate this. Um, if, it, uh, if you find it useful, that, uh, that, that's great. Since uh, this command interacts with vault, so you need to put forward from the vault server. Uh, I have already um, exported the environment variables needed for it. So now let's try to generate a particular root token. Before that, let me show you the already root token that we have actually. So I have uh, exported the root token, which is this one. Now let's try to generate a particular root token. So this is the root token generation common. It's a global root token. You can simply click generate <clears throat> and it will make use of the ANSI keys and the ANSI threshold. And it will try to generate a particular new root token which is completely new. So uh, you can see that uh, the root token generation has been successful and it has generated a particular new root token. And we can check if this root token is actually valid. So let's try to log in uh, to fault with this particular root token to check if this is actually works or not. Uh, yes, so actually we can see that we can actually use uh, this root token that we have just generated using the fault CLI. To log into the vault, and you can see that that a token policy is, is actually root. So now, uh, let's say you want to rotate your vault root token. You want to keep your vault root token, but for safety purpose, since it has it holds the supreme power, you want to rotate it uh, after a particular period of time. Uh, the generate command doesn't actually invalidate the already root token. So I have my uh, root token already enabled, right? So I can actually do all sort of stuff here but the ultimately the root rotate root token will invalidate the current root token if any and it will set up the newly generated root token to the ultimately root token and no matter which backend you use since uh, we can do also the crowd operation using our default cli so it was pretty easy to leverage those options to uh, do this particular task here so now uh, let's try to rotate the Vault root token. So once our root token generation has been successful and root token rotation has been successful, uh, we shouldn't actually be able to log in with our root token that was initially set. So now if I actually try to log in, uh, to vault using the root token that was uh, set in our environment variable as the initial root token, we should see that we cannot log in using that because it has been rotated and our new root token has been generated and it is already set. So now what I can do, I can simply export it again using the same command that we used earlier. So it should up set the updated root token. Now, if I want to log in, I should be able to log in with the update root token. So it's basically as easy as is, uh, you can see to uh, rotate or generate the vault root token using default CLI or making use of the ANSI keys. So uh, as I already mentioned that this is still a work in progress. Uh, we'll probably discuss uh, if the feature is actually useful to our users. And if you're watching and if this is useful to you, uh, so feel free to give us feedback if you actually want it. 
So uh, that was it actually in terms of Kivol CLI and today's webinar. So uh, what I want to recap here. So what we actually did today. So initially uh, I described about the PDB and the updated vault health checker that we recently added in our key vault. So uh, I personally feel the, that that was some of uh, very important and fine tuning features that we actually want to do in terms of key vault or key vault in general. And uh, then I applied some of the vault ops request that you can use to make use of uh, May make your life easy in managing day to life cycle of vault. Uh, then, lastly but not least, I showed you a couple of Kipsital vault command uh, that you can use to update, uh, to rotate, or generate your Kip vault with token. So, uh, that was all from my side. Now it's question and answer time. Nazmul, what do you have? Uh, Nazmul, do you have any question? Uh, so I have seen that uh, there have no question yet. So with this, we are concluding the webinar. Thank you all for your lively participation today. We hope to see you again next time. Our upcoming webinars are already scheduled on our website. Visit appscode.com slash webinar to register. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.